right? I'm not used to having a little thing here. It seems too much like a pulpit or something. But most of you guys know Tony is in California. His folks um, have family in California that have not been doing well health-wise for a long time. And it just seemed like it would be, you know, you never want to miss an opportunity to see someone and not knowing how they're going to do. So um, Tony convinced them to fly oh my goodness. to California. So the three of them, I have a little cute little video I'll show you too. I can show you too. It's adorable uh, on, the, on the airplane. And, but they flew out this morning at like 5 this morning, and they're getting back at midnight tonight. So they are going to be buggy, but they like short, short trips. So that worked well for them. So that's where they are. So pray for their safe return, of course. Um, what's that? No. No, he doesn't, he doesn't like to travel. He doesn't like to go out of town. He likes to stay safe. What's that? He had just finished saying that? He did, huh? Yeah, I know when my mom was in town, what, last week, she made fun of him for never wanting to leave the neighborhood, and yeah. So he doesn't like to go out of town, but he did it for his folks, and um, so they flew into LAX and then drove an hour and a half to where they were going to go, and then drove back to LA through the traffic, and I know Tony's exhausted, but um, anyway, so. What's that? Yep, one day, but that is just their kind of trip. We uh, drove last time in the Sprinter, and mom and dad would literally just go see someone and spend whatever time they felt like they needed. They never want to be in imposition. They never want people to feel like they have to entertain or cook or clean or anything, so they, they are very sensitive about that. So they just go in, they give hugs, they talk for a bit, and leave. I mean, so we'll drive nine hours for two hours, three hours, and then leave. But they like that, and they feel like that way. They're not an imposition, but they still get to see family and, you know, hug everybody's neck. And, um, and that's definitely Tony's kind of trip, too. To leave, I, I thought, I wonder if he's going to be on some terror watch list since he's leaving and coming on the same day. But I figure with two 84-year-olds, it's pretty safe. Uh, speaking of two 84-year-olds, their, their 62nd anniversary is the 24th, which is a Monday. So on the 23rd, um, we'd like to do some kind of celebration something. Um, so anyone who'd like to help out or get little gifts, what Tony's thinking is no big gifts, but just a bunch of little things. Mom would get it, would enjoy that, I think. Just a bunch of little things. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not good at I'm not very creative with that kind of thing. But anyone who wants to help or participate in that, um, I don't know if we're going to have a money tree. I know we did a money tree once for them where we just had a tree so that people could just, you know, stick up some money on there. Just something, you know, just to make them, make them happy. Yeah, we'll have food. It's gonna, we're going to do it on Sunday. So whoever's doing cafe, I guess, that week. But money. <laughs> Quarters for the slot. No, just kidding. Just kidding. She's not a knick-knack person. She's not a collector kind of person. Um, yeah. She likes blankets. She likes stuff that's going to keep her warm. Um, yeah, on their trip, she had a big old blanket, you know, for her little trip. Um, but they're just such good people. They're such sweet people. And um, anyway, so... That's going to be not this coming Sunday, but the following Sunday. Also, of course, pray for their safe trip. But I want you to pray specifically bigger things for your pastor. Um, we're going to be talking about Elijah tonight. Um, Tony's been talking about Elisha. And, you know, Elisha was Elijah's successor. So all we're going to do is go back a couple of steps, kind of to uh, the ending of Elijah's ministry, um, so it's almost like Tony did, what was the movies like Star Wars or where they did like one, two, and three, and then they did like number four, went all the way to the beginning, one of those. I'm doing one of those really creative all the way back to the beginnings, like before Elisha even came about. And Elijah reminds me a lot of Tony, or Tony reminds me a lot of Elijah or whatever. Um, and pray for your pastor. 
he just, he, he, well, we'll see through Elijah's life. It so mirrors Tony's in so many ways. Um, and so I want you to pray specifically for him if you don't mind. But, um, you know, Tony is just, you know, you know, Tony, he's fiery. He's brave. He'll tell you what he thinks you need to hear. He might be wrong, but he'll tell you what he thinks you need to hear, whether you want to hear it or not. Not to make you mad, but to improve you. Always. It is always. I'm telling you, I'm a wife. I mean, I know his bad side. And I'm telling you, as a wife, he is always looking out for the other person. Always. He's never do. He's he's not mean spirited at all. He really isn't. Um, even when people are hateful to him, he'll still forgive. He'll still help. He does tell you. And again, sometimes he could be wrong. He's usually not, which is annoying. Um, that's one of his annoying qualities is he's usually not wrong. But every now and then I'll catch him wrong. So then that gives me permission to say, hey, you could be wrong. Um, but he sees things in people's lives that will concern him, and he cares enough to say it. Hey, this is something I think you need to be aware of, or this is something that you know could really trip you up. And nobody likes to be told. Um, I don't like to be told. You guys probably don't like to. Nobody likes to be told. But he's one of those, Elijah was that way. He just said it. And Elijah probably didn't have any friends because he told people what they needed to hear and probably offended a lot of people. And that's the way it is with Tony. You know, a lot of people don't like him. Um, and he doesn't have people that he really buddies up with. And it's probably largely for that reason. But I think that because of that, if you remember towards the end of Elijah, well, we'll go through Elijah and it'll, it'll make more sense. But Elijah was like that. Elijah was gutsy. He told people what, what they needed to hear. But at the end, he was very alone. He was very discouraged, as we'll see in this uh, passage, and he was ready to step aside. He was ready to give up. I mean, he, was one, he did one of those Moses and Job and Jeremiah prayers where he said, God, just kill me. Just take me right now. Tony's not there. But just that discouragement, just that, what am, what am I here for? We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. We are going to do this differently tonight. You have a Bible in front of you. Use it. We're going to use it. I did not put the passages on the screen specifically so that we could just use our Bible and get used to flipping through the Bible and seeing if, oh, it's, it's page 349 is where we're going to start. It's good just to flip through the Bible. You know, is, is, are, is Kings before Samuel or after Samuel or before First and Second Chronicles or after First and Second Chronicles? The way I remember that, by the way, is it's in reverse alphabetical order. So alphabetical order would be Chronicles, Kings, Samuel. It's Samuel, Kings, Chronicles because it's reverse chronological order. I don't know if you guys had a song or some way that if for kids' church we used a song to memorize the New Testament, but I didn't get push them through the Old Testament. But we're in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19, again, page 349. I'm going to summarize some of it, and then we'll read uh, other parts. But basically, verse 1 through 15, you remember... Most of you remember Elijah and Obadiah. But basically, Elijah had prayed that it wouldn't rain for three years, and it didn't. His prayer, and it talks about this in the book of James, but his prayer made it stop raining for three years. And God told him to pray that. He didn't just do it on his own. And there was a severe drought through the whole land. Well, nobody liked Elijah anyway. They sure didn't like him now because there was a drought throughout all of Israel because of his prayer. King Ahab, the king of Israel, who was incredibly wicked, he was the most wicked king Israel ever had, and his lovely wife Jezebel, who was even worse than Ahab. I mean, just horrible, horrible people. Um, you know, they went, went around and captured uh, God followers and killed them. I mean, they were like ISIS kind of people, um, just murdered them. So there were, uh, Obadiah was more an underground kind of Christian. He was a behind the, well, I shouldn't say behind the scenes, but he was... Um, one of the king, the wicked kings, he was one of the king's servants, which seems weird. How do you, as a Christian, serve under such a wicked, wicked king and not make clear, you know, I'm a Christian or I won't do this? or Because you know he must have done wicked, wicked things. But Obadiah at least took advantage of his position. Stay inside, buddy. He took advantage of his position and he hid 
um, God followers so that they wouldn't, good boy, so that they wouldn't be killed and he hid them, kind of like, um, you know, Corrie ten Boom and, you know, the Nazi, German, uh, Nazi Germany and the, the Jews at that point. So he hid two different groups of 50 people each, so saved at least 100 people of uh, God's prophets, of God's people. Um, uh, Elijah went to, Ahab, uh, went to Obadiah and he said, go tell King Ahab I'm here. And he's like, oh, what did I do to you? You know he's searching everywhere to try to kill you. If you say that you're here and then you leave and I've told him that you're there, he's going to kill me. And he's like, no, trust me, just go tell him that I'm here. That was basically verse 1 through 15. So now turn the page to page 350, top of page 350 where it says Elijah on Mount Carmel. So now we're going to be verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, uh, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Verse 18, I haven't made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. He's talking to the king of Israel. It would be like us talking to uh, the president of the United States. He's a nobody. He's just a king's prophet. He's just a pastor. But you and your father's family have. You abandoned the Lord's command. You have followed the Baals, you know, the false gods of Baals who sacrifice their babies. Not much better than America, uh, I should add. But verse 19, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. His wife, you know, she welcomed all these false prophets in, but she murdered God's prophets. Verse 20, so Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? That, from what I read, that, that uh, literally says, how long will you limp along on or between two twigs? Like, how long are you going to try to balance between these two twigs, these two opinions? How, what's, gonna, what's it going to take for you to get on or get off? So Elijah said, call all the people to witness this. Call all the 850 false prophets but then he looked at the people, basically, look, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this so that you, you can see. And this is one of the saddest parts of the passage where it said, what does it say next? How, if the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But what? What does it say? But the people said nothing. Elijah is there all by himself in front of all of Israel, God's people, God's chosen nation. They've been murdering the prophets of God. Elijah feels like he's all by himself. He's still standing for God. He's still standing against wickedness. He's standing against the culture. He's standing against the status quo. He doesn't really care what people think about him because he already knows what people think about him. He goes in front of the king, in front of all the false prophets, and he says, People, how long are you going to play this game? Get on or get off. And the people, not one person, not one person stood up and said, you know what, Elijah, I'm with you. Let me stand on your side, by your side. I'm with you, Elijah. You are so brave to stand up here in front of God and everybody, in front of all these false prophets, in front of the king of Israel. You are so brave, Elijah, to do it. I'm standing with you, Elijah. Not one person. Even Obadiah. Again, I have mixed feelings about Obadiah. He, he, he did good things, and it says that he loved God, but he was, again, one of those, I'm going to blend in with the crowd. You know, the fish, I don't know if you can see one of the fish is swimming the wrong way. That's a good thing when you're standing, standing against the culture. That's not a good thing when you're trying to lead people and no one's following. Elijah was a leader of God, a prophet of God, and no one was following. Where are we? Verse 22. Go to verse 22. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets. I mean, this just proves he felt all alone. I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. Why? Again, because Ahab and Jezebel killed them all. But Baal has 450 prophets. By the way, I know I keep doing these asides, but isn't it so much fun? Numbers don't mean anything. 
You can go to a church with 5,000 people, and it may be horribly ungodly compared to a church of 50 people. Now, I tell Tony that all the time to try to encourage him. He says, but healthy things grow. And that's true. Healthy things should grow. If you have a healthy plant, it grows. If you have a healthy baby, it grows. And, and that's true. But Jesus turned the world upside down with 11 guys. 11. He could have had big crowds. He did have big crowds, and he chased them away because he could tell that they were all about them. What are you going to give me? What are you feeding me in cafe this week? Are you going to heal me this week? They all followed him until he said hard things, and then they treated Jesus just like they did all these prophets and just like they do with a lot of the preachers who are willing to stand up and tell you the truth, not whatever your itching ears want to hear, not oh, we're going to do culturally relevant messages. This is culturally relevant, period. Yeah, we have to think it through a little bit. Wow, how could that apply to my life? But you don't, we don't need to do messages on how to change your baby's diapers in three minutes or less just to get people to show up. Uh, that's not what Tony's here for. You know, I'm just, I'm just a lovely wife. Oh, hopefully I'm not the Jezebel, but I'm just the lovely wife. But um, so numbers don't mean anything. I understand what Tony's saying, that a healthy church grows, and it should. But Jehovah's Witness churches, they're growing. Mormon churches, they're growing. Tickling, itching ear churches, they're growing. Most Southern Baptist churches or most Bible teaching, really solid Bible teaching churches, are not growing. Does that mean God is not blessing them? No, it means this culture is swimming away from God. And people who are willing to stand up and just say it have very few people, and then they feel discouraged because they have very few people. And they feel like Elijah, I'm the only one left. You know, nobody's really listening. What am I doing? All right, verse 23. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces, put it on the wood, but don't set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull, put it on the wood, and I won't set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God. I'll call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. And then you go through verse after verse after verse. That's kind of funny. We won't go through all of it. But what's Elijah's attitude? For those of you who remember this story, what's his attitude through um, that whole process? He's making fun of their God. He mocks. He's sarcastic. That's not tolerated in this culture. Tony makes a big deal of drawing distinctions between what we believe and what other religions believe. And he makes people mad every time he does it. He doesn't even do it. He doesn't do it in a mocking kind of way. I mean, not like Elijah. You remember when they're praying to their God and Elijah's like, you might want to yell louder. I don't think he can hear you. They're cutting themselves. They're bleeding. And he's not like, okay, you know what? Let's stop this. Let's get a doctor. Let's settle this, you know, on a very, you know, humane level. He's mocking them. And then finally, this is Tony's favorite part, but he says, I think your, your God might be in the bathroom. He was mocking them. Tony doesn't draw distinctions between Christianity and other religions to mock or to be mean-spirited, but that's what makes Christianity. Christianity is the distinctions. So many people say, oh, don't talk about what you're against. Talk about what you're for. Oh, it's so much easier to attract people with honey than vinegar. Yes, I understand. Elijah would have poured vinegar down their throats. He would have sprinkled vinegar all over them. He didn't care about attracting people. He cared about telling them the truth. Yes, yeah, say it in a nice way if you can say it in a nice way. Have your, your speech always seasoned, what does the Bible say, with grace and truth. Always. But you got to tell them. Even if they don't want to hear it, you have to tell them. So I just think that's kind of funny. And then all the people said, what you say is good. They didn't have anything to say when they said, hey, get on or get off. How long are you going to waver? How long are you going to try to balance between these two twigs? But now when he says, hey, we're going to have a show, folks. Step right up, step right up. 850 prophets of Baal on this side and me on the other side. We're doing this. We're having a showdown at Mount Carmel. They said, yeah. Like little wrestling fans. Yeah, get me a ringside seat. Is there a ringside in wrestling? I don't know, but yeah. Or maybe they were saying, you know what? Good, we'll have proof. Don't tell me to believe by faith. Have God come down here and talk to me himself. Maybe, maybe they were that. But Okay, let's jump all the way down to 39. 39. 
So, again, of course, you, you remember the story. Um, the prophets of Baal cut up their cow, prayed, cut themselves. They said Baal was the god of fire, so it should be fair. should be a fair fight. They cut themselves up. They prayed. They danced. They cried. They cut. They whatever. And nothing happened, of course, because Baal is fake. Then Elijah said, you know what? Pour some water on this. You know what? Pour some more water on this. Pour up so much water that the water is overflowing in all the trenches and it's running off. And then he said, God, you show them. You show them that you're the true God, no other God. You show them that you sent me here to, to reveal to them that you're the true God. And what happened? <laughs> Everything got burned up. The, uh, the sacrifice got burned up. The wood got burned up. Everything got burned up. Then 39. Then when all the people saw this, they said, Oh, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But their faith is based on their emotions and their experience. Um, just like when people go to Christian concerts, they're like, Oh, God is so good. God is so good. And the next day, everything's kind of... There's nothing wrong with Christian concerts. There's nothing wrong with God is so good. There's God is so good. No, nothing wrong with that. We just need to get beyond that. We need to get deeper than that. So that on Saturday night at the concert, that's awesome. Sunday night at church, that's awesome. Monday through Friday, we ought to still be awesome. We ought to still be living for God. And we know through Israel's history, this didn't last. This emotional experience didn't last. Verse 40, then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let any of them get away. They seized them and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and he slaughtered them there. That sounds horrible. But God had said so many times before, get rid of the wickedness among you. Get rid of it. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. Had it rained yet? Was there the sound of heavy rain? No. Had it rained one drop yet? No, it hadn't. But he knew it was going to rain because God said, I'm, I'm going to let it rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, which almost seemed like he was listening to Elijah. Elijah was a leader, but Ahab really wasn't following. He probably just didn't want to get slaughtered like the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah just got slaughtered. But, Elijah, but uh, Ahab did what Elijah said. Uh, and, but Elijah climbed to the, to the top of Carmel, and he bent down to the ground, and he put his face between his knees. He prayed because he knew God and God made promises, but God didn't always fulfill his promises like we expect him to. You know what I mean? He told, we've been talking about in kids' church with Sarah and Abraham, and God told Sarah, or God told Abraham, you're going to have a kid, and what, it was like 13 years later where they said, uh, I don't think God kind of meant it maybe the way he, you know, the way he said it, so maybe it's through Hagar. Why don't you go sleep with Hagar and let her get pregnant and it'll be my kid? Because God makes promises, but then he lets a lot of time pass. So maybe Elijah was a little concerned that God wasn't going to do the promise right then. He put his face to the ground and prayed. Verse 43, go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And then he went up and looked there. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, okay, go back. Okay, go back again. Oh, okay, okay, go back again, squint. Go, go, okay, go back again. I bet he was getting nervous. God could have done it on the very first time. God could have shown him on the second time. God could have shown him on the third time, but he didn't. Uh, he, 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 he stretches us. Wherever we are, that's a good place, but there's always a better place to be. You know how Tony's always pulling on our spiritual rug, trying to get us? He tries to shake us up, not to get us unstable, but to get us solid to get us moving forward, to get us to grow deep roots so that we're not like, I have, I'm growing sunflowers at the office. Oh, Savannah, there, there are some of them that are 10 feet tall. I'm not kidding, 10 feet tall. And then all of a sudden it's like, Bruh. hey, what are you doing so heavy up here and you're not heavy down there? And then I stick a little broomstick up against it to hold it up. Tony wants us solid. That's how God wants us. So God is always pulling, always stretching, always stretching our faith. Mm, seven times, the seventh time, verse 44. The seventh time the servant reported uh, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. 
OK, Elijah, maybe, maybe it was just on my glasses, but it's little bitty bitty. As, he didn't even say as big as a man's hand. It's tiny as a man's hand. And then Elijah said, ooh, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Verse 45, meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The winds rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. I read in one place that's very trustworthy, that's about six miles. I read in another place that's equally trustworthy, that's between 15 and 25 miles. Now, can any one of you run six miles ahead of a chariot? I can't even go around the block either. How, what's a mile? That's like eight minutes. I mean, depending on how fast you are. I remember, was it Bruce Jenner? Was it Caitlin who broke the six-minute mile, or that was somebody else? I don't know. <laughs> Do you guys hear about this? A complete aside. The bo- was it a boxer? Yeah, a boxer who was tra- is transgender, and he's a guy, but he decided to become a woman, and he's competing in women's boxing. It's either box. I think it's boxing. And so he keeps beating all the women because uh, he's a dude. And he broke the orbit of one woman. And nobody can last more than two minutes because he keeps beating up women. It's like, uh, if you're born a dude, don't beat up women. I think that's a pretty safe rule. But our culture is so messed up. And that's the point. We have to get to the place where maybe we won't be as bold as Elijah. Maybe we won't be bold like Tony because we don't want everyone not to like us. I'm not saying nobody likes Tony. Poor Tony's going to be watching this. He's like, hey, people like me. People like me. But you know what I mean. Maybe we won't be that bold. But we sure shouldn't be like my sunflower plant. We sure shouldn't just fold when the pressure's on. We need to stand up, and it's hard to stand up. I mean, shoot, even on Facebook, if you put one conservative thing down, man, you get blasted. You put a rainbow over your face and everybody loves you. It's like, come on, people. Seriously, come on. I want I want Facebook to put a I do not like for so that you know how you have like? Yeah, yeah. I want I do not like. But that's just me. Then I get nasty notes too. Yeah. That's another place where Tony gets I guess you know what? Everybody has a filter. I think I'm starting to lose my filter a bit. I think I'm starting to take my filter off because I am so sick and tired of, honestly, and this isn't just a crazy wife thing. Maybe it is. Tony gets in trouble. So uh, this is on Facebook where he's not a stalker. It's, I mean, you guys friend him or don't friend him, you know. Be careful what you put if you're going to friend your pastor. I mean, duh. But when people will put all this Jesus loves me stuff, and then the very next post is like, wow, dude, women read this page. Don't put stuff like that. And there was one church, we don't really have membership, but a faithful church attender who put one bad thing after another bad thing after another bad thing after another bad thing, and finally he's like, hey, careful. Careful how you're representing yourself. That's it. He didn't slam this person. He didn't say mean things about this person. Just careful. He had threats on his life. People were like, you know, I forget the words they used, but basically, we'll just shoot him. I mean, people just started jumping into this person's defense. We'll just shoot him. It's like, come on, people. And by the way, this is also another aside. You can see, I think I'll just start having a couple drinks before I show up, and that way my filter will be completely off. Just kidding. I was just kidding, just kidding. He is not associated with the current burrito barn anymore. I don't know if you guys know that. I think most of you know that. He had church people emailing him basically saying, what a man of, what a ungodly man you are uh, because of what's happening here and here and here. He's like, hey, I'm getting jacked around just like you are and this isn't this isn't my thing anymore i haven't had anything to do with this since april but he's getting chewed out from church people that obviously aren't showing up and haven't shown up since that amount of time or they would have probably known um, when you know when they're that closely associated people just need to back off people need to cut him some slack no wonder he gets discouraged no wonder he gets like elijah and no one's listening 
You know he doesn't get paid for this. This is his entire life, is to help us stand before God. He has to give an account not only of his life before God, he has to give an account of our life before God. I don't want him to. That scares me. I don't want him to have to give an account of our lives before God. I'd rather him just walk away and not have to give an account for anybody's life. You know what I mean? I think people need to cut him a little slack and give him a little bit of a benefit of the doubt. I just yesterday, I think we probably lost three more people texting and getting mad about one thing or another. Pastors are in a tough position if they're willing to just stand up and not care about being liked and just say what they need to say. That dude's got guts. He does. He just has guts because everybody wants to be liked, including your pastor. But for people to just slam him back and forth, I'm, that filter thing, forget it. Filters are overrated. I'll start being the bad guy. You think, you'll, you think he's bad, boy. You're going to feel lucky when he talks. Just kidding. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Will you go out and just greet and hi? <laughs> that scar, he's friendly. Sorry. All right, where was I on my rambling? Let's jump to uh, chapter 19, verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel, so this wicked king Ahab told his more wicked wife Jezebel. It seems like Jezebel was the one murdering all the prophets. Everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets, all the false prophets, with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like one of them. And what does verse 3 say? Elijah was afraid. This dude had no fear. He stood up against 850 false prophets. He stood up against the king of Israel. He stood up against the entire nation of Israel. And now one mouthy woman says, you know what? I'm going to cut your head off. You come, I dare you take one step closer to me, buddy. And he was afraid. Now, I don't know what, when it says afraid. You know, maybe he figured, I kind of wonder if he just felt so overwhelmed that Jezebel didn't get it. Everything, out of everything that just happened, and he couldn't even convince Jezebel, she was there. She saw what happened. Ahab was there. He saw what happened with their 850 prophets praying to their God, cutting themselves, doing all this, nothing happened, and then God showed himself. God revealed himself, and he couldn't even convince Jezebel. Maybe he felt like, Psh, you've got to be kidding me, God. They're not listening to me. Why am I doing this? I'm just talking and talking and talking, and they still, I'm going to die now. I'm going to go through all of this, and now you're going to let me die by the hand of some crazy woman? So, I don't know. When he came to, uh, finishing verse 3, when he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. He was not having a pity party. He was spiritually, physically, emotionally spent. He was exhausted. He was wasted. He had nothing left. I mean, he has someone coming to kill him, and he just falls asleep under the bush. But again, Job, Moses, Jeremiah, all three, those are some of the most godly men in the Bible. I mean, we think of people like David, a man after God's own heart, but then we can see their sin just as big. You know, Moses and Job and Jeremiah and Elijah, we don't see a lot of, well, we don't see sin. We see this where he's just exhausted and spent. That's the only first sign of weakness we've seen in Elijah during this whole time. All at once an angel touched him and he said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he lay down again. By the way, sometimes comfort food is good medicine. Don't you dare tell Tony I said that or I will deny it. <laughs> For him, comfort food is, what would you say? Oh, he won't watch. Just kidding. <laughs> comfort food is not good medicine. He should have had 
no carbs and proteins and <laughs> sticks and whatever he says I eat. What does he say I eat? Sticks and sticks and what? Berries. berries. Sticks and berries. That's yeah. Sticks and berries would have done a body good. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. If you remember, Horeb is where Moses was. That's where he got the Ten Commandments. That's where Moses went for 40 days and 40 nights without food. It looks like Elijah had food beforehand, but then went 40 days and 40 nights without food. Maybe God was trying to take him back to his roots. Maybe God was trying to give him a different perspective. Maybe God was showing him back to his beginning again. I mean, he obviously, God knew that he was depressed. When Elijah said, just take my life, God could have done it. Okay, you're going to sleep. I'll just leave you asleep. Good night. Farewell. But he didn't. Elijah needed a rest. He needed refreshment. Maybe he needed a little bit of reminder. God took him away from his entire situation. This is like Hagar too. We've been talking about in kids' church. When Sarah was mistreating Hagar so badly and Hagar left, she made it almost all the way to Egypt, walking almost all the way to Egypt, where she basically sat down under a bush to die. Not because she wanted to, she didn't have any water. And the baby cried, and she cried out to God, I guess, but God heard the baby and then revealed himself to her. And then he said, turn around, where are you going? He, I love how God asks questions. Where are you going, Hagar? Hagar, a servant of Sarah. Where are you going? Like, hey, I know you. I know who you are. Do you know who you are? Where are you going? And then she told him, and then he said, go back to your mistress. Go back to Sarah. It's like, you couldn't have told me that five miles out? You had to wait till I almost got all the way to Egypt to tell me to turn around and go back? But I think God just knows sometimes we need some alone time. We need some quiet time. We need time. Well, don't you know you're so overwhelmed with something, and then a few days later it's not that big of a deal? He was so overwhelmed. Hagar was so overwhelmed. And God just let them walk it off, exercise it off. Just get away from the situation. Just get some time. Maybe you'll get a different perspective. And then where are we? Verse 9, and the word of the Lord came to him, again, asking a question, just like he did with Hagar. Asked him a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Uh, you sent me here? <laughs> uh, your angel kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, eat some carbs and drink some water and get some rest and go? I mean, what are you really asking, Lord? He didn't really get sarcastic. He just said, he didn't even respond with his pity party. He just kind of laid out the facts. He said, verse 10, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. God, my life is a failure. My ministry is a failure. I haven't accomplished anything I was supposed to. I am no better than my ancestors. You tell me what I'm doing here, God. You put me here. You let all your other prophets get put to the sword. Now you're letting this woman, this crazy woman with an ax, chase after me and kill. I don't know that she had an ax. That was just a funny picture. Arr! Like the Wizard of Oz. I'm going to get you, girly, and your dog, too. Verse 11. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the... Oh, wait a minute. Where is he standing? Go and stand on the mountain. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. Thanks, God. <laughs> you go stand in a safe place, Elijah. Let's put you on a mountain. The wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And you remember the end. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. 
When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and he stood at the mouth of the cave. I, don't, I know that's a very popular passage. I don't really know what it means. Maybe it's God saying, look, maybe I'm not acting the way you expect. Maybe I'm not revealing myself where you would expect, in the places you would expect. But even in my silence, I'm there. Maybe that was it. Or maybe he whispered something specific. I don't know. I mean, it's easy to just, I don't know. People say all sorts of things about that passage. I don't really know what it means, but that's what it kind of, that's what I read in it. Just trust me in my silence. Trust me when I'm not acting the way you expect me to act. And then finishing in verse 13, God said again, a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, we put our own intonations in. I don't know if he was saying, what are you doing here? Or, what are you doing here? Or, what are you doing here? I, I don't know what he was saying. People, again, you can read commentaries on this. Oh, people know exactly what God was saying. I don't know what God was saying, but I know he asked the question, Elijah answered, and then God gave him this experience that I also don't understand, but it was a huge mind-blowing, life-altering experience, God asked him the same question. And Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. He said the same thing, like God just didn't hear him the first time. I don't know what that means, but it makes me wonder if he just didn't get it. You know, God was trying to change his perspective. God was trying to show him something different. And he just, he wasn't any different after that experience than he was before. I don't know. But then we see in verse 15, the Lord God said, the Lord God said to him, we're finished. Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha. That's who Tony's been talking about the last several weeks. So again, I went backwards to see where Elisha gets appointed and anointed. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. By the way, Elijah, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Now, when I was reading over this passage and I was reading commentaries, most people kind of put a different twist to this than I put. I know I tend to be a little bit on the negative side. <laughs> but most people say God knew exactly what he needed. He needed a new commission and new comfort and a new companion. And so God gave him Elisha. To me, it was like, you're done. Okay, Elijah, you're done. And I don't know whether it was God, I don't want to use the word punishing him, but punishing him for not change, like God's trying to change his perspective, God's trying to open up his eyes, and nothing really changed. It was like he was in a rut that he wasn't going to get out of whether it was that or whether it was God just acknowledging you've done your part. You've done your job. You've done everything I wanted you to do. You're done. It's time to hand the baton off to someone younger and more energetic and is ready to go who hasn't had all this. What's that movie, Men in Black, where they see the aliens and at the end it was, uh, jo uh, what's that guy, the old guy's name? What's his name? Will Smith and what? Tommy Lee Jones. I was thinking James Earl Jones. That's not it. Tommy Lee Jones. And at the end, he's old. He's seen too many things. And he wants that little light shined in his eyes so that he can't remember any of it. Because he's like, I've seen things I don't want to see. And it was time to hand the baton off to Will Smith. He was fresh blood. Maybe that's what we see with Elisha. I don't think he was giving him a friend. I don't think he was giving him a new ministry. I think he was giving him a replacement. 
And that replacement was Elisha, which brought us to Elisha. Okay, verse 19. We're almost done. Verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. I love that virtually all of God's men that God calls, what do you find them doing in the Old Testament? They're just working. Even in the New Testament, the disciples are just fishing. Gideon, he's threshing wheat. Is that right? Threshing wheat? When I said it, I thought, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think it's threshing wheat in the wine press. They're working. They're just busy at it. I think until God has, a, has put us on a path where we feel like, yes, this is exactly what God wants me to do, I think we just need to be responsible and work and be the people we need to be so that when God wants a shovel, I'm that shovel, God. God wants a screwdriver. Hey, she's a good screwdriver over there. You know, God needs a tool or wants to use you as a tool in his ministry. You're ready. Elisha was ready. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. I don't see this as a sweet thing. I see this as a here. <laughs> I don't see this as this majestic, who's the, the, the um, musician who would do, 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 do. James Brown with his, with his cloak, with his, you know, people would throw it on him in this majestic way and he'd throw it off. I don't think this was that. I think it was almost like, here, dude, you're up. He threw his cloak. It didn't say he draped it over him or he threw it around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my mother and my father goodbye and then I'll come after you. And this makes this passage make so much more sense. Elijah replied, go back. What have I done to you? <laughs> Fine, whatever, just go. You know, I think Elijah was just kind of done. Not done loving God, not done serving God, just finished with his part. He was James Earl, not James Earl Jones, but Tommy Lee Jones. 21, so Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. Again, Tony talked about this when he talked about Elisha. He burned the plowing equipment. I love that. Elisha was ready to go, and he was saying, I'm done here. I'm burning it all up. I don't want any temptation to come back. I am full-time in the ministry. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat. He gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah, and he became his servant. He didn't need to be a superstar. He didn't need a title. He didn't need a little desk with a name plate or a big old badge. He went, and he was Elijah's servant. All right, the bottom line is, I think this is what I see kind of like Tony and our, you know, our pastor versus Elijah. When the pastor seems alone, it is concerning. It is concerning when the pastor feels. Now, Elijah felt like he was all alone. God said, by the way, there are 7,000 who haven't bowed down to me. How many of them were following Elijah? None of them. None of them. So that, that's good. I mean, God is basically saying there is still work to be done. But none of them were following Elijah. So I can understand why Elijah was feeling pretty worthless about it. But when the pastor seems alone, it is concerning. When the people seem apathetic, what does apathetic mean? They don't care. Sympathy means to feel the same as someone. Apathy is not feel anything. I don't have any feeling. I don't care. Whatever. You know how teenagers say whatever and roll their eyes? Yeah. Where you want to poke them out? Yeah. That's apathetic. They don't, they don't care. <laughs> when, the pa when the people seem apathetic, when he talks to all of Israel and he says, how long are you going to waver on these two rinky-dinky sticks? And what did the people say? Nothing. They didn't stand with him. They didn't say, yeah, you're right. They didn't challenge him, but the scripture says they didn't see anything. When the pastor seems alone, it's concerning. When the people seem apathetic, it's concerning. And when the possibilities seem absent, it is concerning. Elijah didn't see any hope for the future. Elijah didn't see that anything was changing. Now, God obviously had other things in mind, but for him, it seemed like it was kind of done. And sometimes... Our pastor and our church seems like this to me, where he kind of feels alone, and the people, the masses, I mean, you guys are the good guys. You guys are the Wednesday night crowd. But you know what I mean. 
and it's smart to evaluate the health of the body. It's smart to evaluate kind of where we are and where we need to be. It's smart to get shaken up a little bit. It's smart to have to go back and look seven times for something. We need to evaluate. Because at least with Elijah, God still spoke to him. God told him. He didn't tell him everything. But, you know, we don't believe God speaks that way today. We have this. But that leaves pastors in kind of a difficult situation sometimes. I mean, what if you don't hear that still small voice? You know, and when people do hear that still small voice, we're always wondering, maybe that was your still small voice. Maybe it wasn't God's still small voice. It's very subjective. You have to be careful. You know, God wants me to tell you this today. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's just coming out of you. You know, when God's not speaking directly to you, and again, I don't think he does that today. He could. He's God. He can do anything he wants. I just don't think he does because we have this. So what if you don't see those things? What if you don't see God working in your life the way Elijah obviously saw God working in his life? I mean, he was there. He was at Mount Carmel. He saw those things happen. He got fed in the, the creek, you know, the bread and the fish, and he saw it. But nowadays, what about when you don't see those things? I mean, that's where Tony is. He doesn't see those things. I mean, talk about being discouraged when you do see them compared to when you don't. What about when you don't see, when you can't answer the question, hey, what are you doing here? And I think that's where... We tend to be sometimes. What are you doing here? What are you accomplishing here? That question gets hard to answer sometimes. Tony doesn't pastor this church because Tony wants to feel like he's the king of the mountain. Is that, is that That's the right game, king of the mountain, when you're on the top and you try to knock everybody else down? He doesn't do this for his own ego. He doesn't do this to try to be a pastor. I'm a real pastor. I'm a real pastor. He does it because he wants to make a difference in people's lives. Elijah got to the place where he felt he wasn't making any difference in people's lives. And I understand why Elijah felt that way. Obviously, he was. But I understand why Elijah felt that way. Nobody was following. All his buddies, all the other prophets were killed. He was all by himself. Nobody liked him. He still had God, but God wasn't really doing what he expected. God tried to help him see, okay, I'm not necessarily in the earthquake or in the fire. I'm not where you expect. But trust me in my silence. And I think Elijah did trust him, but he was finished. It's hard to know sometimes when you're finished. So I want to ask you to pray for a couple of things. That God would help you see what are you doing here. You shouldn't go to church just to go to church. You shouldn't go to church to feel like you're a good Christian. You shouldn't go to church because it's a good social time. There's nothing wrong with those things. You should go to church to serve God to honor God, to be part of a body. And in part of a body, we're all kind of working together. Again, I'm talking to the choir. I'm not preaching to the choir because I'm not a preacher. But you know what I mean. But what, just kind of sharing with you the struggle that Tony has to go through so, you, so that you can pray for him and, and, and think for him and, you know, help him, reason with him. But you guys know, I mean, we have virtually... Nobody in kids' church, we've lost virtually all of our helpers. Not all of them. We still have the superstars. but Virtually nobody in, well, I mean, you know, Tony kind of has to oversee everything, kind of has to do everything. And you guys, I mean, cafe, that, that's good. But you guys know how it is. I mean, out of a church of 200 people, we shouldn't have to be looking for five people to do stuff. That's kind of crazy. That's, that's kind of a sad state. I think we as a church, and that's me, we as a church need to think, what are we doing here? Are we just here? Because eh, this is it's close to my house, and I get church out of the way, and it's kind of fun, and I get to eat. Shame on you if you come to eat. Shame on you if the first thing you do is grab as many chips and Cokes as you can. Shame on you. We should be here to serve God. We should be here to roll up our sleeves. We should be here to encourage our pastor. Remember Moses, where he had to hold up the, the staff, wasn't it? And then her, and who is the other one? Aaron. Aaron, I want to say Ben, because of Ben, her. Ben and her 
Tony would watch it and say, oh, Lauren. Joshua? I think it was Aaron. We'll look it up. Anyway, two good dudes held up Moses' arms. They were there because Moses was a man and his arm. It was tired. Shoot, if you were just hold up your arm with no staff, shoot, you try to hold it up for five minutes. I dare you. It'd be, ugh, ugh. And they came beside him and they held his arms up. We need to be holding up his arms. Or say, you know what, just put your arms down. The battle's over. We lost. Sorry. We need to be here to hold his arms up. I mean, if a hospital visit needs to be made, who goes? Tony or me. You know what I mean? Things that a church should be... We should have so many volunteers. You have 200 people coming to church. You shouldn't have 20 people on a Wednesday night. And again, I'm not chewing you guys out. I'm sharing the struggle so that you can pray with us. You can pray for him. I mean, he has high highs and low lows like Elijah, where Elijah's on Mount Carmel, and he's just big and bold, and then he's laying under a bush saying, I'm done, I'm finished. What am I doing here? You're asking me, God, what am I doing here? I don't know. You tell me what I'm doing here. What are we doing here? I think it's time for us to get on or get off. We need to serve God. We need to hold him up, not just in word, in deed. Figure out what needs to be done and do it. We ought to have, We shouldn't have to put people on the payroll to get weeds pulled and to get plumbing done and to get nothing wrong with, you know, getting paid to do stuff around the church. But you know what I mean? Uh, We shouldn't have to do that. Tony shouldn't have to do that. He should have people all around him helping him. So ask yourself, what are you doing here? And ask God to help us see what are we doing here. Help Tony see. Me too because I'm his wife, but Tony is the one I'm concerned about. Tony needs to see what he's doing here. Whether it's time for him to hand the baton off to somebody else, which is kind of sad because there isn't anybody else. You know, Tony can't really take vacations. Tony can't take a sabbatical. Tony can't say, you know what, I need a couple months off. I need a break. I just need to rest. We We don't have people to stand up and do this. You know what I mean? He can't really take that break. He can't get that rest and that relaxation that even Elijah got. He can't get that renewed perspective. So pray for him. He doesn't have people like that. And that's not your fault, and that's not... God's fault, and it's not Tony's fault. God just hasn't brought those people in, or maybe those people got mad and left. I don't know. But just pray that God would help us all see what we're kind of doing here as a family. We're a family. We should. We're a body. We should work as a body. We should work as a family. Okay. So pray that God would help us all see what we're doing here, and help us have more wisdom so that we can understand what that question even means. Because I don't know what God meant when he was asking Elijah, but I sure hope I understand what it means when he asked me. Cool? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for bold people like Elijah. God, who are willing to say what needs to be said, even if they know they're not going to be liked, even if they know they're going to be rejected. God, even when people aren't following God, help there be more people like Elijah. God, help there be more people like Tony who were willing to do what they do out of love for you and love for others. God, please give him strength. Give him encouragement. God, help him just see what is he doing here? What are we doing here? God, what do we need to do? How do we move forward from here? God, please give us wisdom. Please give us courage. God, give us whatever we need to do to work most effectively for you, not for us, for you. God, help us see that. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these people. Thank you for their love for their pastor. God, thank you that we can struggle together as a family, as a church body. God, we don't want to waste our lives. We don't want to waste our ministries. God, thank you that we can do this together. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So he comes back about midnight tonight. So pray for a safe trip. Don't you dare call him at 12.